Hello world, it's Will. I'm in my office and I'm playing with computers. Um, I wanted to make a video about this. This is my 68030 single board computer. Uh, it's called the KISS 68030 and it's designed by John Kaufman. I built this board myself. Um, it's part of the Retro Brew Computers uh, project. Uh, if you want to check them out on the web, they're at retrobrewcomputers.org. Uh, the project used to be called N8VEM, but it uh, changed name at the end of last year. I've built a few N8VEM boards before based on Z80 or Z180 processors. Uh, these are 8-bit processors with a 16-bit address space, which means they can address up to 64 kilobytes of memory at once. Um, they have an 8-bit data bus, and they normally use static RAMs. This board's quite different. It has a 32-bit processor. It's got a Motorola 68030. Um, it has a 32-bit address space, which means it can address up to 4 gigabytes of memory. It has 32-bit registers, and the uh, memory data bus is 32 bits wide, which means it can pull in or push out four times as much data to or from memory as the Z80s can in each individual cycle. Um, the memory on the board is comprised of a 8-bit wide 32K static RAM, an 8-bit wide 512K ROM, and 32-bit wide dynamic RAMs, which fit in these two SIM sockets here. Uh, the board can take up to 256 megabytes of 32-bit uh, wide dynamic RAM, which is significantly larger than the uh, previous N8 VEM boards. Dynamic RAM is, of course, more complex to talk to for two reasons. First of all, um, the dynamic RAM, as the name suggests, loses its contents if the uh, data isn't refreshed periodically. And secondly, um, the size of the memory array is so large that there aren't enough physical pins on the package to have one pin per address line. So instead, uh, two address lines are multiplexed onto each pin as a row address and a column address. So in fact, this board is mostly an experiment in dynamic RAM control. Uh, the dynamic RAM control is achieved through the use of four GALs, which are programmable logic devices. They are a step more complex than the previous PAL devices and less complex than the successors, uh, which are CPLDs or FPGAs. The, um, the GALs on the board are these chips here with the white labels on top of them. This... Uh, GAL here takes the output of this 8 megahertz oscillator, divides it by 125, and that gives a clock that ticks at 64,000 ticks per second. That clock is used to trigger the dynamic RAM refresh cycles. Uh, so 64,000 times per second, the dynamic RAMs uh, refresh the contents of their memory. Um, the uh, DRAM chip here generates the row address select signals the bytes chip here generates the column address select signals and the read-write control signals for the memory. And the high chip here uh, generates the chip select signals. These three chips here are multiplexers, which take the 32-bit address and multiplex it onto the uh, address lines of the DRAMs. Um, this board has um, a 32 megahertz oscillator fitted for the CPU and a 64 megahertz oscillator fitted to uh, for the timing for the dynamic RAMs. The board has absolutely no I.O. at all on it. Um, so it has a companion board, which is this board here, the multifunction pick board, which is another uh, John Kaufman design. Again, I built this board. It's based on several chips. The NS32202 is an interrupt controller and a timer. Uh, this chip here is a 16750 UART, which implements a serial port. Uh, this chip here is an 8255 uh, parallel interface adapter, which is used uh, with a compact flash adapter to uh, give an IDE interface. And this chip here is a DS1302, which is a real-time clock, um, which uh, keeps time when the system is powered off and also stores a small amount of uh, information in non-volatile memory, which stores the configuration of the machine. Um, it has a uh, supercapacitor as a uh, power supply for when the system is unplugged. So what I'm going to do is put this system together. I'm going to put some dynamic RAMs in the uh, memory sockets, and I'm going to put uh, the system uh, boards into this back plane here, and we'll power it up, and we'll uh, get some software running on it. So there we go. The system is now fully assembled. A couple of notes on how I've got it set up. I've got a compact flash card loaded into the IDE interface. 
Um, I've got a uh, pigtail connected to the RS232 output that goes through a null modem cable into a um, RS232 to USB adapter, which I'm going to plug into a laptop. Um, I've got two 128 megabyte uh, EDO 5 volt 70 nanosecond non parity SIMs loaded into the board. Um, and these jumpers here let you control the number of weight states. Um, I've got it set up for uh, two IO weight states, one weight state on access to the dynamic RAM, and no weight states on access to the ROM. Okay, so I'm going to power on the system now. Okay, so I'm going to power up the machine now. There's the ROM running. I'm going to hit X to interrupt the automatic startup sequence. Uh, the ROM is based on the mini M68K ROM with some additions. It supports loading files from a FAT format file system on the IDE device. Uh, you can use ls or dir at the command line interface to list the contents of the current directory. You can use cd to change directory. Uh, a couple of commands will let you read and write the contents of memory. So if we have a look, um, there's some data in memory. We can overwrite that with new data if we want to. So there we go, we can see our data has been written into memory. Um, if you type a file name, it will try and interpret that file as an executable. It understands ELF and COF format executables, and it also understands how to uh, load uh, Linux kernels. Um, if you have just a flat binary file, you can load that as well. Um, so I've got a, uh, just a plain file here that's not an executable. I'm going to tell it to load that into memory at address 4000. It's 50 bytes long decimal, so let's have a look at that. I think 50 decimal is 3.2 in hex. So we can see that the boot.cmd file um, is a text file. Now, if the boot.cmd file is present on the file system, then when the system boots, the ROM will interpret any commands in boot.cmd as if they had been typed by the user. And this can be used to start the system automatically. So you can see that my boot.cmd file uh, tells it to load in a file called VM Linux from drive zero and then passes in the command line arguments to make Linux work properly. In this case, it sets the console and it tells it where to find the root file system. So what I'm going to do now is I'll reset the machine again and will allow it to boot automatically using that command from boot.cmd. So now it's loading the Linux kernel. And that's Linux booting now. Um, I've written drivers for Linux to support all of the peripherals in the machine. It supports the um, IDE through the 8255. It supports the UART. Uh, it supports the NS32202 as both a timer and an interrupt controller. And it supports the DS1302 real-time clock. It takes about 10 minutes from power on to get to a login prompt. So I'm going to uh, accelerate through the next part and play it at uh, faster than normal speed. Okay, so the system's finished booting and it's just given me a login prompt. Uh, if you want to log in, the username is root and the password, shh, don't tell anyone, is root. And there we are. We've got a bash prompt and I think you'll find this is a surprisingly usable system. Um, all the tools and utilities you expect to have are all on the uh, file system image I'm going to upload. You can see the real-time clock is working. Um, system's been up and running for a little while. It knows what sort of CPU it has and what sort of FPU it doesn't have. It knows what platform it's running on. It's found all the memory in the machine. You can see it's actually using only about three megabytes of that memory at the moment. Um, plus whatever the kernel's using, of course. Um, you can read the partition table off the hard disk. Um, the um, 
boot file system that the uh, ROM uses is also mounted and available from Linux. So we can see the um, command file that we used earlier to boot the system. The system is also completely self-hosting. And by self-hosting, what I mean is that all the software that's running on the machine can be built on the machine. So for example, uh, I've got the source code to the Linux kernel that we're running here. And you can build this kernel on this machine. It takes a while. It takes about 46 hours, if I remember correctly. So it's nearly two days to build the kernel. Um, for comparison, if I build the kernel exactly the same source code, exactly the same configuration, if I cross-compile that kernel on my desktop machine, which is a quad-core 3.4 gigahertz Intel machine, it's about a three-year-old processor, um, then it takes 40 seconds. So that's about 4,000 times faster. Um, so the hardware has got a lot faster in the last 30 years. Um, you can also build the uh, ROM on the machine. So I've got the source code to the ROM here as well. And a couple of days ago, I wrote a program uh, called uh, Flash 030, which is uh, based on my Flash 4 tool for the Z80 uh, N8VEM machines. And Flash 030 is an in-system uh, ROM reprogrammer. So you can actually reprogram the Flash ROM in the KISS 68030 without having to take it out of the socket now. So uh, let's do that now. Let's do a write of um, the ROM that's been built on the machine. It's, uh, it won't fill the full 512K of the ROM, so I have to tell it to do a partial flash. There we go. It's reprogrammed the ROM. And next time I reboot, I'll be running the, the ROM that I built on the machine itself. A um, couple of tips on using this machine. Um, I find at the moment the main restriction I have is that getting files onto the machine is a bit tricky. Um, one way to do it, if you've got a lot of files to transfer, is to shut the machine down, take out the compact flash card, load the files and do it that way. Um, the second way to do it is to um, use Z-Modem. And most of the time, Z-Modem's a lot quicker, given that it takes about 10 minutes to boot the machine up. The command to start a Z-Modem received through the console port is RZ. So you do RZ. And then you need to tell your terminal software to send a file. So I'm going to tell it to do a Z modem upload. So I'm going to send the Flash 030 source code. There we go, it's uploaded. Uh, another useful tool is uh, Screen. Screen will let you do more than one thing at once on the console. Having only a single uh, UART uh, console is a little bit restrictive otherwise. So um, screen is very handy. It, it's a terminal multiplexer basically. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, go into the BIOS uh, source and I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to tell it to clean the source and rebuild it. So that's going to start running now. So off it goes. It's cleaning the source and building. If I hit control A C it will create a new terminal session and I can run something else in here. So let's edit the uh, Flash 030 source code. So there we go, we've got Vim running now and we can edit the source code to our program. And if we hit uh, Control A C again, we can open another terminal session. Let's run something like uh, VM stat. Uh, so we can see how the machine is performing. So there we go, we can see the CPU is quite busy. Uh, it's writing out a little bit to the disk every now and then. If we hit Control A space, it will take us back to our um, session where we're building the ROM and Control A space again. There is our Vim editor still running. Control A space again, and there is VMstat running still. So as you can see, it's a pretty capable machine. You can get on with all sorts of things. Um, it works very well. I really recommend it. If you uh, have an interest in uh, building your own Linux machine from chips, this is a great place to start. If you're interested in uh, building computers in general, I really recommend the RetroBrew Computers Forum. There's a lot of very uh, knowledgeable and intelligent people on there. 
there's some really interesting machines to build. This one's quite a complex machine. Uh, if, you're, if it's for your first one, I would suggest you start with a Z80 machine, maybe something like the Zeta 2. Um, it's a nice, simple design. Or the, uh, if you want something a little bit more complicated, the um, Mark IV uh, single board computer is a Z180 machine, is a bit more capable than the uh, Zeta 2, and it has a couple of other um, disk interfaces built onto the board as standard. Um, but anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed building the uh, KISS 68030. It was very educational to port Linux over to it. Um, I'm going to make everything I've done available so that other people can uh, build on it. And uh, yeah, I hope if you're interested, you get involved. Thank you. Bye-bye.